Welcome to the podcast of Living Faith Fellowship in Klamath Falls, Oregon. Now, you will hear Pastor Rich preach the sermon Close to the Enemy's Fire from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, verses 53 through 64. We pray that God will use this sermon to speak to you directly. And now, to Pastor Rich. So Solomon said in Proverbs 6, 27, Can a man take fire to his bosom and his clothes not be burned? According to BibleRef.com, this passage warns of the dangers of sexual sin. This statement is echoed in a common proverb in the English language today. See if this rings true. If you play with fire, you're going to get burned. You guys are on top of it. That's great. In the same way, if you dabble with sexual sin, there's going to be consequences. But I would add, if you dabble in any sin, all sin brings consequences. Keep that in the back of your mind as you open your Bibles with me to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, as we jump back into that study we took a short break out of. As you're turning there, let's recap really quickly where we were. Last time in the Gospel of Mark... We learned how Judas brought this massive group of armed soldiers and temple police to arrest Jesus at night. Totally illegal. Then Judas identified Jesus with a kiss. It seems somehow that Jesus wasn't recognized by these soldiers. And so Judas gives him a kiss. And after the kiss of betrayal, then the mob lays hands on Jesus and they take him away. During the arrest, we learn this out of the Gospel of John 18, 10. It says, Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear, and his name was Malchus. I said this last time, but it just blows me away that the all-knowing God, God who knows everything that's about to happen, takes time out of this to heal someone who has come to arrest him while he's submitted to the Father, and he's doing all this for those he loves. Warren Wiersbe said, Our Lord's struggle there in the garden could only be understood by what was about to happen on the cross. Remember what was about to happen on the cross. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For him, God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to actually, on the cross, become sin for us, And in exchange, we become the righteousness of God in him. And that took place on the cross. So today's passage, as we jump back in, is the first illegal, immoral trial of Jesus before the high priest. And while this is going on, we've already learned that all the disciples have forsaken Jesus. While this is going on, Peter is found warming himself at the enemy's fire. So if you have your Sunday sermon notes, Roman numeral one, the beginning of the trials. If your Bibles are open, Mark 14, let's start with verse 53. It says, and they led Jesus away to the high priest and with him were assembled, catch these players, all the chief priests, the elders and the scribes. Warren Wiersbe said, the Jewish trial was opened by Annas the former high priest, there in your notes. It was then moved to the full council to hear witnesses and then to an early morning session before the final vote of condemnation. Remember from last time, we learned who these people were. We learned that the religious leaders of Israel were known as the Sanhedrin and they were made up of three groups. Listen to their job descriptions one more time. First were the chief priests whose call was to lead the nation in worship. Then were the scribes. These are the Bible scholars of the day who know all the prophecies. They know all the promises. And then finally, the elders who were charged with the spiritual welfare of the nation. So we have the worship leaders, the Bible scholars, and those who are charged to take care of the spiritual needs of the nation. And they are trying Jesus. We also learned last time that there were six illegal trials of Jesus. Remember, there were three by the Jews, one before Annas the high priest, 
one before Caiaphas, and then finally the whole Sanhedrin. Then Jesus was tried three times before the Gentiles. Once before Pilate, transferred over to Herod, back to Pilate. These trials, we listed last time how many laws within the Jewish law they broke, trying them at night, trying them without the correct witnesses and all these different things. There was a whole list. But in today's passage, these religious leaders get together. They're at Caiaphas's house and they're waiting for Jesus to come be delivered to him. First illegal trial and all his followers forsook him. There in your notes. Jesus was at the beginning stages of the illegal, immoral treatment and trials from the religious leaders. Soon, the Gentiles would be involved, which will culminate with his brutal death. So again, where are the disciples? They have all forsaken Jesus. And so Roman numeral two, Peter tries to fade within the crowd. Look at verse 54. But Peter followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he sat with the servants and warmed himself at the fire. Really quickly, let's talk about the progression of Peter denying Jesus, because you can watch it happen. It was a slow fade into sin, and you can watch exactly how it happened. Number one there in your notes, Peter's pride and self-confidence led to his denial of Jesus. His pride and self-confidence. I heard somebody over the weekend say, you know, this following Jesus is just too hard. I can't do it. And I thought to myself, Eureka, that person is close. They actually understand. Because let me tell you a secret. You can't follow Jesus. Not properly. You can't follow Jesus on your own strength. If you do, you will fail. And by the way, that's called religion. You need the Holy Spirit in order to follow Jesus. This following Jesus thing is just too hard. You're absolutely right. You couldn't be any more righter. <laughs> there in your notes. Peter's denial began after Jesus' arrest. But his denial was a slow fade into sin, which began when Peter argued with the word of God that came through Jesus. Remember a few weeks ago in Mark 14, 27, it says, Then Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this very night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I've been raised, I go before you to Galilee. But Peter, my favorite apostle, said to him, Even if everybody else does it, I will never, 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 never forsake you, Lord. No way. I'll never be made to stumble. Peter, in essence, was telling Jesus, I know better than you. You just said we're all going to stumble. And I'm telling you, Jesus, that sounds great. And yeah, there all those other guys are going to do it, but not me. I know better than you. Peter was prideful and his pride caused him to be weak in his flesh. We should be careful of pride. I want to share a verse with you about pride that has always struck fear in my heart. I'm not afraid of God. I'm not. Perfect love casts out fear, First John tells me. So I'm not afraid of God. But this verse has always left me going, Ooh, I fear me. I don't fear God. James 4, 6 says this. Listen to this. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Notice what that says. The creator God of the universe, the almighty, all powerful, all knowing God of the universe resists the proud. Now, if God can create, if God can do anything and he says, I resist the proud. That's scary to me, but gives grace to the humble. Hmm. OK, number two. Peter's prayerlessness led to his denial of Christ. Remember, we learned a while ago that Peter was sleeping when he should have been praying. And then finally, we see in verse 54, number three, Peter following Jesus from afar led to his denial of Jesus. If we try to follow Jesus from afar, just have a casual Christianity, we will somehow end up denying him. 
This morning, I had a dream about three o'clock this morning. And I had a dream about a relative who's not saved and we're not the closest. We, in fact, we've probably seen each other in the last 25 years, maybe once. And I had this dream and we were sitting down at my house for a meal and my Holy Spirit helper, Sandra, <laughs> asked me if I was gonna say grace over the meal. And because this gentleman is not a believer, I kind of went, oh, thank you, Lord, for that. Let's go. Amen. And so in my dream, I'm convicted because I am not living Jesus, proclaiming Jesus loud. And this is a true story. At 320, whatever it was that I woke up, I woke up reciting Romans 1. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for the Jew first and then for the Gentile. I was pretty impressed I remembered that in my sleep. <laughs> but how convicting for me to say I would deny. But if we're following Jesus from afar, we will end up denying him somehow, some way. I, I think about GPS, right? Got a smartphone and you say, you know, OK, Google, uh, take me here or whatever. Before GPS or cell phones, if you were following someone to a certain location, you're going down I-5, you wouldn't let a lot of people jump in between you and that car you're following because you don't want to get lost. So it is with following Jesus. Don't let things get in between you and Jesus. Follow him closely. You know, when we think about the first sin in the Bible, we often go to Adam and Eve eating the forbidden fruit. And you're quasi right, but there's a sin right before that that I want to point out to you. Genesis 3.1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, listen to her words, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open. Listen to this pride. God knows your eyes will be open and you'll be just like God, knowing good and evil. I want you, first of all, to note the differences between what God told Eve and what Eve said God told her, because there's some differences. First thing is Eve omitted God's name, talking about the freedoms that God gave. Then she recites his name when she's talking about the one restriction. This is how the world operates today. Think about this. Eve added to and subtracted from the word of God. She subtracted. Every tree you may freely eat. How'd she add? You may not even touch it lest you die. God never said that. Listen to what the law says about adding to or subtracting from the word of God. Deuteronomy 4.2. You shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord, which the Lord God commanded you. Let's talk about what Satan did here. Because Satan's a crafty guy. Let me tell you something. Satan is not all knowing. He's not present everywhere. He's not all powerful. But he's been around for a very long time. So this guy knows how to play dirty. He knows. There's nothing new under the sun. But look what he did. Satan questioned the word of God. Has God indeed said? Then Satan contradicted the word of God. You will not surely die. And then last, and this is my personal favorite. Satan made sin attractive. I want you to think about this. If sin wasn't attractive, who would sin? You know, think about this. If every time you sin, it was like taking a ball peen hammer and smashing your pinky finger. Who'd want to do that? Maybe there's a sadist around or something, but most people would not want to do that. Why would you want to sin? But sin, Satan makes it look attractive. Notice what he said. Your eyes will be open and you'll be just like God. Said every false cult in the world. Your eyes will be open and you'll be just like God. This is the problem there in your notes. Satan uses half truths to sugarcoat things to get us to swallow his poison. 
Again, no one would knowingly want to swallow that poison. Now, next week, we're going to see the ultimate denial of Peter. But here's my question about this passage. How could somebody like Peter, who followed Jesus for three full years, got to see his miracles, knew that he knew that he knew that he knew who Jesus was. And he even said, Jesus, I don't care if the whole world denies you. It will never happen. How, from that statement, just a few moments later, is he stumbling? How did it happen? Well, the final fall was because Peter was following Jesus from afar. He let things get in between him and Jesus in their relationship. And then we notice Peter finally, he's hanging out at the enemy's fire. He's warming himself with the enemy's fire. And this is what I say about a modern context for us, warming ourselves at an enemy's fire. You ready? It's a picture of us becoming so comfortable with our sin that our sin becomes a besetting sin. Think about this. Something that starts out just so innocent. God has, hasn't truly said that. And we kind of start dabbling around with the sin a little bit and pretty soon it becomes a besetting sin in our lives. And we'll get more into that in the practical application. But first, Roman numeral three, false witness testimonies. Look at verse 55. It says, now the chief priests and all the council sought testimony against Jesus to put him to death. But catch this, they found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimonies did not agree. Then some rose up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. But not even then did their testimony agree. What's so wild about this is these religious leaders aren't seeking the truth. What they're doing is they're seeking somebody to agree with their lies. This is a setup. It's hypocrisy at its best, but they want people to say the same narrative that they have been saying in this mock trial. There in your notes, the same thing is happening today. People who are opposed to Jesus only listen to the voices of others who affirm their low view of who Jesus is, and they repeat the hostility towards Jesus. Notice what they said, because this, this, is, this is telling how people twist your words. What these false witnesses said, we heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands. Listen to what Jesus actually said. John 2.19, Jesus said, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. Notice what they said. Jesus actually said he was going to destroy the temple. And what Jesus actually said was, if you destroy this temple and see, Jesus was talking about himself there in John. But these guys turn that around. That doesn't happen today, right? Jesus, by the way, never said, he never said the words, this temple made with hands. Why is that important? Because Jesus wasn't made with hands. Jesus never said those words, and yet they twist his words around. I'll tell you exactly what they're doing. They're accusing him of being a modern day terrorist wanting to destroy the temple. William Lane said this, the accusation was utterly serious because throughout the Roman Grecian world, the destruction or desecration of any holy place was a capital offense. So if Jesus truly destroyed the temple, he should be put to death according to Roman law. But notice, not even did their testimony agree. The accusers could not put together a good case. They wouldn't agree with one another. There in your notes, Alan Cole said, it was harder to agree on the consistent lie than to tell the simple truth. I've heard this said before. If you just tell the truth, no problem, right? If you're being questioned by the police and we have a few in the room, if you've got nothing to hide, call a lawyer anyway. No, um... <laughs> But as long as you tell the truth, tell the truth. It's easy to remember the truth. You asked me something that happened 20 years ago and, you know, I can sit here and tell you this is how I remember it. And here's exactly what happened. Now, if I made up a story 20 years ago, boy, I don't remember what I told you. 
That's going to be hard. But the mockery and hypocrisy of this fake trial is starting to fall apart. They all have the same goal and they're all trying to tell the same story, but it's falling apart right before their eyes. So Roman numeral four, the final charge against the Lord. Look at verse 60. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus saying, do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But he kept silent and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him saying, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? Jesus said, I am. And you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, what further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. F.F. F. Bruce said this, that the high priest arose from his seat and advanced towards Jesus showed that he was irritated and baffled. He had lost the battle of wits. He's irritated. The trials have proven no guilt whatsoever. They got the son of God on trial and they can't find anything that will stick. They've thrown everything at the wall and nothing has stuck. But listen to what the end of Matthew tells us. And this is a scary thought. Matthew 25, 31 says, when the son of man comes in all his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides the sheep from the goats. There is coming a day when the Lord Jesus Christ will judge every single person on planet Earth. And during this time, these unrighteous leaders think that they are trying Jesus. What they don't know is they're the ones on trial. Jesus is not on trial here. Jesus by the preordained, foreordained knowledge and will of God the Father is there. And they think they're trying him. But if the truth be told, they're on trial. And here's the deal. Every person who has not received the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior is going to be before the great white throne judgment. That day is coming. That day is as sure as yesterday happened. That day is coming. But for all of those who would receive the free gift of salvation through the cross and receive the forgiveness of sins, there in your notes, this is what Timothy Keller says. The cross is the place where the judge takes the judgment. The judge takes the judgment. This was the father's plan. It was also the son's willing sacrifice. It's like that story of Billy Graham that got pulled over for speeding. And, and as he gets pulled over, the sheriff's deputy tells him, Billy, you were speeding in our county. You got to come pay the fine before you're released. And so they take Billy into the barber shop and the barber actually doubled as the justice of the peace. Justice of the peace says, hang on, let me finish this haircut. I'll be right with you. Finishes the haircut, takes his robe off, puts his judge robe on. And he says, OK, Billy, you got caught speeding. How do you plea? Guilty, your honor. OK, well, that will be ten dollars. You owe this county ten dollars. And Billy said, your honor, I am so sorry. I don't have any cash. Judge says, well, I'm telling you what, you're going to jail. If you can't pay the fine, you're going to jail. Right then, the judge reaches over into his barber's drawer, opens it, takes ten dollars out. And he said, Billy, you did the crime. I'm making the payment at the cross. The judge took the penalty. You understand that? And as they questioned Jesus, he won't respond to their ridiculous charges. He just won't. And you'd say, why? Again, why? He's being questioned. This is God in the flesh. He could tear him apart, right? He could say anything. Way 800 years earlier, the prophet Isaiah told us why. Isaiah 53, 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. So Jesus won't answer them. They're casting all these ridiculous arguments at him. And Jesus, nope, nope, nope. But then, 
They plainly ask him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? And Jesus is about to tell them the truth. There's a lot in that small statement. There's so much there. The Christ, the son of the blessed, is obviously a messianic title. These religious leaders ask Jesus, are you the Christ? Are you the son of the blessed? Christ in the Greek is, is the word Christos. It means Messiah, the anointed one, the chosen one. And it's a reference to the promised Messiah of God. So are you the Christ? Yup. Blessed. Are you the blessed? Means the one who's blessed or praised. And it catches in the Bible, it's only used of God. Are you the son of the blessed? Are you God in the flesh? Yes. So they asked Jesus, are you the promised Messiah? There in your notes, the question behind the question from the high priest is, are you the king who will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish justice and righteousness forever? And so in verse 62, Jesus very clearly identifies himself and he leaves very little room for doubt. In fact, he leaves no room for doubt. You may have heard people say, Jesus has never claimed to be God in the Bible. You've never read your Bible because Jesus has claimed to be God over and over again. And here he does it again, because notice what Jesus says. First of all, he says, I am. And we talked about this several weeks ago. The word I am is ego a me. What it means is I am who I am, the self-existent God. They asked Jesus, are you Messiah? And he said, I'm God. Whoa. And if you don't think they understood, if you think I'm wrong, wait to see how they react when Jesus says these words. Then Jesus calls himself the son of man. It comes out of Daniel chapter seven. Jesus is called son of man over 80 times within the four gospels. Jesus said in John 5, 26, for as the father has life in himself, so he has granted the son to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the son of man. This is what Matthew Henry said about that passage out of Daniel 7, 13. The son of man, because he was made in the likeness of a man and he was found fashion as a man. He's the only mediator between God and man. He's like unto the son of man, but he is the son of God. Then Jesus says something else in case all those other statements don't do it for you. And you're like, well, OK, Jesus said, you will see the son of man at the right hand of the power. The power to the Jews very obviously meant God himself. And by the way, the right side is always known as the side of power. Jesus said, you're going to see me at the right hand of the father. I am the promised Messiah. I'm God in the flesh. And again, if you don't think that they knew what he was claiming, look again at verse 63. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, what further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. Now you might say, okay, they tore their clothes. Big deal. Actually, it is a big deal. Their very own law, listen to what their law told the priest about their clothing. Leviticus 10, six. Moses said to Aaron and Eleazar and Ithamar, his sons, do not cover your heads nor tear your clothes or what will happen? Lest you die and wrath come upon all the people. What's going to happen if a priest tears his clothing? You're going to die and you're going to bring his wrath upon all the people. I read an article about this and basically what the article said is they weren't allowed to engage themselves in a the common mourning like other people would tear their clothes and put ash all over their head because they represented God. And to do these things as mourning actually misrepresented the priest for God. The priest was God's representative and they were set apart for his service. And the robes were made with a specific design to show God. 
And so by tearing that, they're basically showing that God's torn apart. Robes were not personal garments. They were holy unto God. And so to to rip them, they deserve death. So here they're trying to kill Jesus and say Jesus is guilty of blasphemy. But what they just did was worthy of death. How ironic, how hypocritical. So here the religious leaders tell Jesus, you're guilty of blasphemy. This is what Merriam-Webster said about blasphemy. Blasphemy in a religious sense refers to a great disrespect towards God or something holy. And heresy basically says it's going against what God has said. The law very clearly taught if you're guilty of blasphemy, if you're guilty of heresy, you're to be put to death as well. And that's what they're trying to prove. Leviticus 24, 16. And whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall certainly stone him, the stranger as well as the one born in the land. When he blasphemes the name of the Lord, he shall be put to death. And so that's what they're trying to put on Jesus. He's claimed himself to be God. He's claimed himself to be the promised Messiah. He's worthy of death. And yet what they just did was actually worthy of death. And we'll get more into that next week. But for practical application, I said earlier that there's coming a day that Jesus will judge the nations. Here, these unrighteous religious leaders think they have him on trial, and yet they're the ones on trial. Truth be told, Jesus wasn't on trial at all. So how I'd like to end with some practical application is watching how Peter went into a slow fade into compromise and give some practical steps how we ourselves can stay away from that slow fade, uh, avoid falling into them same traps. As review, think about this. Again, how did Peter end up there? Well, first of all, Peter questioned the word of God when Jesus gave it to him. Number two, Peter followed from afar rather than staying close to Jesus. And finally, this is the big one. Peter hung out with the enemy and warmed himself at the enemy's fire. Some practical steps that we can take to avoiding the same trap. Number one there in your notes. Christians should have a high regard for the word of God as we read it, meditate on it, and trust it for our guidebook. We don't live in North Korea or communist country where, you know, the Bible is so scarce. I probably own 25 copies. You can come in here and get a copy anytime you want. We can get the word of God on our smartphones. We can get the word of God. We're so spoiled that we end up being flippant with the word of God and we don't take advantage of it. But I want to tell you how important it is to God himself. God puts a pretty big priority on his word. When you think of the names of God, right, there's hundreds of them. You, you think of Jesus as the great I am. He, he's the Rosa Sharon. He's the lover of your soul. You know, there's all these names of God, all these names of Jesus. Listen to what the psalmist said in Psalm 138 too. You have magnified your word above all of your name. As important as the name of God is, God himself has put his word above his name. Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. In the New Testament, Paul told his protege, Timothy, how important the word of God is. 2 Timothy 3, 16. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Why? That the man of God may be complete, that's mature, thoroughly equipped for every good work. You want to be equipped for good work? You need the word of God. All right, number two. We need a close relationship with Jesus while being careful not to lag behind his leading. You see, having that close relationship, being close with Jesus and not allowing other things to come between us is how we discern his will. It's how we live. He gives us all we need for life and godliness and being close to him and not letting other things in the way. That's how we grow through study and through prayer and his Holy Spirit. 
Let me tell you how sin starts to infiltrate the life of a believer. If we allow sin to linger too long, soon it will dominate our lives. Test me on this. We've probably all been there. We can probably all say that. I want to use a little MMA to demonstrate this, okay? If you've ever watched an MMA battle, see if this rings true. Sin and the enemy are like MMA. What they start with is a foothold, the Bible calls it. Then they go from a foothold to a full leg lock. They just got you wrapped up. And then pretty soon, they get you in a chokehold and you're tapping out because that's what sin does. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. That brings up number three. If we allow sin to go unchecked in our lives, we will start to live for the flesh in the world. Us sitting at the enemy's fire, warming ourselves, is equivalent to a besetting sin. Sin's a liar. Sin will always cost you more than you want to spend, and it will always take you further than you ever intended to go. We do it the same way that Peter did it. We start questioning the word of God. We, we're full of pride, all these different things. But sin in your life will always cost you more than you expected to pay for it. It will always take you further than you wanted to go. Because here's the enemy's and sin's goal in, your, in our lives. It's to create a barrier in our relationship between us and Jesus. And as it creates that barrier, that barrier gets bigger and thicker and bigger and bigger and bigger. And as that barrier gets bigger, pretty soon we are ineffective for the kingdom or the kingdom work. You see, Satan has a twofold goal. Number one, he wants to see you never come to Christ. He wants to see you die in your sin. If you've come to Christ, He's not done. If you've come to Christ, great, but he's not done. So if you've come to Christ, his next goal then is to make you ineffective for the kingdom. That's his twofold goal. How can we stay away from that slow fade into the chokehold? First, our pride and self-confidence will lead us into the denial of Jesus. Again, I had someone say, you know, this walk with Jesus is so hard, I can't do it. You, my friend, are right. If you're doing it in your own power, you can't. You cannot. Number two, our prayerlessness will lead us into the denial of Christ. Prayer is our dynamite, dunamis power given by God, that two-way conversation with the creator, God of the universe. We can boldly come to the throne room of grace anytime we have need. And yet we put it on the shelf and forget all about it. That will lead to the denial of Christ. And finally, following from afar will lead to the denial of Christ. Our proximity to Jesus Christ matters. Our adversary, the devil, is well pleased when we allow walls and things to go up. Satan tries to get us to give up our closeness to Jesus with just a little compromise at a time. I'm going to end with this one verse. John 15, 5. Jesus very clearly said, I'm the vine. You're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. And then in case you're wondering, does he really mean that? He said, for without me, you can do nothing. Well, there it is. <laughs> he who abides in me and I in him will bear much fruit. You'll do much for the kingdom. But without me, you can do nothing. Trying hard, struggling to be a good boy or girl doesn't work. And I said this to the first service, so I'll say it to you. I want you to think about an apple orchard. If you've ever picked apples in an apple orchard, you walk out in the midst of all these trees. I've been to Washington State. And we're up there picking boxes of apples, right? And we walk in. Here's all these trees full of apples. You know what I didn't hear while I was up there? Ugh! Never heard it once. Not one of those trees were struggling to make apples. <laughs> Not a one of them. And I was like, but how are the apples made? Because they're abiding in the vine. And Jesus says it right here. If you abide in me and I in you, you will bear many apples. Without the vine, 
You can't make an apple. You can struggle and grunt all you want, but you're not going to make an apple. You're just not. This Christian life is so hard, I can't do it. Praise God. Step one, I can't. Praise God. Step two, ask him he can. If you abide in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. That's the Christian life, guys. The Christian life isn't religion come to, come to Sunday meeting. That's not the Christian life. We can have pagans, non-believers, 400 non-believers come every Sunday. It means nothing. The Christian life is realizing, I can't do it. And then accepting the one who can. And then not only are you saved, but when you get to that point, then you start living the abundant life. But I want you to go out with that verse, John 15, 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him will bear much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Meditate on that this week. Thank you for listening to Pastor Rich preach the sermon close to the enemy's fire from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, verses 53 through 64. Tune in next week as Pastor Rich continues in the Gospel of Mark series. Join us every Sunday morning, either in person at 9 a.m. or 10.30 a.m. or online at 10.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Watch our live stream on our website, YouTube, or Facebook page. Our website is livingfaithclimate.com. To find our Facebook, YouTube, or Instagram profile, simply search for Living Faith Fellowship Klamath. You can also find these links in the description of this week's episode. All sermons are available on our website. Simply click on the resources tab and then click on sermons. If you want to show your appreciation, you can tell others about us, subscribe to our podcast, and you can also leave a review so more people can hear the word of God. Thank you again and God bless you.